There's a lot of other nonsense talked about sailing. Sailing has an image problem. The image is often far removed from the reality of what sailing actually is. And that's the basic problem, or one of the problems. I mean, sailing is about idyllic drifting across the water. In gorgeous sunshine. I've gone completely off course. And in exotic locations. Of course, all these things have a nugget of truth in them. That's what makes them believable. And the problem is, <laughs> that nugget tends to be a bit small. <laughs> it's not a large nugget of truth. It's often quite a small one. And that's where the problem comes in. Yes, after a few years sailing around on this boat, I think sailing has become more of a mindset thing than uh, anything else. And that mindset has a number of features to it that I think you need to master if you're going to be truly happy sailing. Or at least cruising, in our case. Let's start off with privacy. We basically live in a kitchen dinette with two bedrooms and an outside garden chair. Okay, we get some tremendous views, but that's it. There's not a lot of space on there for a lot of privacy. If you're the sort of person that needs a lot of your own time and a lot of your own space, you ain't going to get it on board. It's that simple. Because the boat isn't physically big enough to allow you to have it. And then there's the glamour issue. Oh yeah! Sailing is so glamorous. <coughs> ah yes, glamorous. You're looking a bit over glam. Yeah, I want to talk about the glamour of sailing. So I'm going to start with doing the washing up. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where you are, you've still got to do all the maintenance and everything else before you really, really do get to the glamour part of it. There's a lot of horse, whatever, before you get to any glamour. I feel totally underdressed now. I know, but what the hell. So, we know that people think sailing is glamorous and we don't think we're glamorous enough, so we've glammed up in our glad rags. Um, it is going to cause some difficulties though, because while this may be the glamour of sailing, I do have to service the engine today. Somebody else has to do the washing up right here. And it may not be practical, but we'll give it a go and see what happens. Things made for land use don't really seem to do very well at sea, so sadly my heels are long gone. Uh, a mixture of salt and being stuck in the bottom of a locker, a bit of mould, things like that. I've claimed them, glues have come loose. So my current footwear doesn't quite match my glam, but you know, needs must when the devil drives and we're at sea, I expect sailors to be adaptable. <laughs> Giving it a go, I think it's back to scruffy mode. And then there's cost. I mean, everything costs in life. The costs are going up all the time. Things are getting more expensive as we go along. But boats have a special cost all of their own. It's called the marina factor. You stick the word marine in front of anything and the legend is the cost quadruples. There's probably some truth in that. I mean, I'm fitting a new line here because our old ones are getting absolutely hammered. This stuff is not cheap, it's expensive, but it does its job extremely well. And to be honest, I wouldn't entertain using any other kind of line. But we don't enjoy paying costs more than anyone else does. What I find is, if you get land-based stuff, it generally doesn't last very long on board. The salt eats it. If it contains mild steel, it's doomed. If it contains brass, it'll go green very quickly. Then there are other hidden issues that you don't expect to come out and bite you. 
So what's happening with the diesel, Bev? <laughs> well, firstly, thank God I got out of the glam stuff because <laughs> it's lovely to wear, but it's so impractical. Um, it also didn't help that my, my shoes got hammered, but never mind, put all that to one side. It's been so long since I've done this. We don't have the glass bowl one, we have the aluminium bowl one. It's been so long since I did this, I forgot to loosen the drain screw first. When I took the top screw out, I was always conscious back in my head this thing can be a devil to, to pull down. <laughs> Wait till the diesel did the job for me, so I'm not going to clean the bilge. <laughs> but putting all that aside, it's a minor thing. I'm not going to get all upset about it. I'm not going to have a screaming ab dab. Um, this is the new filter. Fits nicely under the body. The old filter, I am pleased to report, is so clean I could use it again. But I'm not going to. It's going in the bin. It's an old filter. Got the new filter. But obviously there's no bug in the thing because this is the first place it would show up on top of this filter here. And this filter is beautiful. It's a work of art. There's a little bit of grime around the edges, but come on, it's been on for a year. What do you expect? So, um, just in case of getting on with it and cleaning up my own mess that I made. So what's happening now, Bev? I don't know the fog is clear, you just handed me this. Um, I was talking about the right tool, remember? You want to talk about right tools. Oh. Okay, just hang on, let me get my mental capacities up to whatever they are. Um, up to strength. We had to use one of these chain wrenches to get the... Um, diesel filter. Thank you. You see, I'm, I was nowhere near the diesel filter, I was on impeller. Anyway. <laughs> We had to use this to get the um, the diesel filter off, and I'll be honest, it's a bit of a nightmare to use, but it's easier to use than the other one of these we have, which the problem is it doesn't fit the space of the impellers, and so you can't actually, you can get it on. Well, no, you can't get it on, actually. But if you could get it on, you couldn't move it. So we had to use this monstrosity here, which you put around it. And then, of course, the, the, the diesel filter is hung upside down, so you've got to do it clockwise to loosen it instead of anti-clockwise, which caused a few upsets. But... We also have around here, somewhere or other, I don't know where it's gone, uh, a multi-tool that somebody gave us, which is very nice, but the problem with these multi-tools is there's that many tools built into the handles that they're very, 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 very bulky, and they just get in the way. So we went back to the right tool for the job, and um, basically if you've got one job, get one tool for it. It's my preferred option. Now I'm going back to the impeller, which is a different problem, because our normal impeller has a bar in the middle, like that, and the impellers that we got in the job lot have no bar in the middle like that, but they do send you the bar so you can drill a hole yourself. Which is not really what I wanted to do with my afternoon, but let's give it a go. Is that the impeller going in? Yeah, I cheated. I went out and I bought a new one. Uh, a lot more money than the batch. Because uh, obviously we got the batch lock cheap. But the thing is, it's a lot less hassle. Um, but I'm going to have to sort um, something out because I'll need spares. So with all this in mind, not that we're going to be doing it, but we were having a look at the safety requirements for crossing an ocean. Because we were curious. I mean, let's face it, we're going nowhere. <laughs> we're having trouble getting out to sail just here. But... Uh, it turns out that if you want to cross the ocean and you want to go on the Atlantic Rally for cruisers, um, they'll take any boat from 8 metres up. It's all about mindset. It's all about prep. And this is the other legend that we get in, in sailing, the blue water boat. You must buy a blue water boat. If you don't buy a blue water boat, you will die when you go out. And it's frankly a little old <laughs> We were just curious about the arc, so we looked up the specs about what you have to do for entry, and there's basically about four or five pages of specifications, and if you meet them, you can go. It doesn't say in anywhere in the specs that you have to have a thin keel boat or a long keel boat. It doesn't say whether it has to have a skeg rudder. It doesn't have to say that it has to be a 45 footer. It doesn't say in it anywhere that it has to be able to set out a force 10 storm or anything like that. It doesn't say anywhere in it that it has to have fiberglass sides two inches thick. There's nothing like that in it. What it does say is you have to have the following safety equipment. And it's a big list. <laughs> That's quite hard to comprehensive. You must have the same, the certain type of sails fitted to your boat. And if you don't have them, then you need certain types of reef fitted to your boat. And it goes on like this for pages and pages and pages. 
And then there are the articles of people in the middle of the Pacific in the little island chains where there's nothing, quite literally. And off the boats there, some of them are the old fashioned heavy big ones that would count as blue water boats. And the other ones are like this, production boats, which apparently you're told can't cross oceans. Well, the reality is that 49% of the ones in one of the anchorages that was surveyed were boats just like this one. They were production boats and they had sailed there because there's no other way to get them there. So the upshot of that is that it's quite clear that the definition of a blue water boat is very, very variable. And I think it's so variable that the category doesn't actually exist. What does exist is a blue water mindset. And part of a blue water mindset is part of what should be every cruiser or every boater's mindset. And that is be prepared, check everything out, get everything you need, do all the maintenance. If you have to, spend the money. It's painful. I don't like spending the money. <laughs> I really don't. But when I do, I buy marine stuff because it lasts, it's more durable, and I can usually shop around and get some sort of bargain. Um, if I'm looking at a chart plotter, I can usually buy a chart plotter from company A, I can usually buy the same chart plotter from company B, and there's sometimes quite significant price differences. Maybe a model is changing and come to the end. You might want to look at things like that. But I think really that one of sailing's glamours is this thing that there are definable categories that you can have for everything. That there's a cruising boat, that there's a, a blue water boat, that there's a boat for this, there's a boat for that. There's not. There's just well-prepared boats, well-prepared crews, well-prepared skippers, well-researched items. In the end, you've got to look at it the bright side. If my belief is true, then there's hope for all of us.